All right, so let's talk about uh, some sort of assumptions and predictions about the things we've just said. So what we can now say uh, with some degree of confidence based purely on what we could call uh, a, a simple uh, theory of choice <clears throat> is, is a prediction that compensating wage differentials will be associated with various job characteristics. Okay, so compensating wage differentials which by the way to break down this phrase okay, is saying that there will be a wage a difference in the wages across comparable jobs that compensates the worker for the things that are not the same so that's sort of what this phrase means we're compensating workers with different wages for different working environments okay so compensating wage differentials will be associated with uh, various but certain job characteristics. Right? So positive differentials i.e. higher wages uh, will accompany sort of bad jobs and negative uh, differentials so lower wages will accompany good jobs. Okay, <clears throat> And so from this, uh, workers are able to choose among themselves which combination of wages and working conditions uh, will be best for them. Right Now it's important to recognize that this is only true if everything else is, is the same or close enough to the same between the two jobs. So we're assuming that familiar ceteris paribus, right, which is Latin for uh, all else being equal, basically, okay? And so as a result, the theory is not that workers working in bad working conditions are paid more than workers working in good working conditions. The prediction is that holding everything else constant, workers in bad working conditions uh, will receive higher wages than workers in more pleasant working conditions. Okay, So there are a lot of factors that have to be held constant before this pattern is observed in the real world, such as skill level, age, experience, race, gender, union status, location, and so on and so forth. Okay, We've also uh, implicitly been making uh, three assumptions. Okay, So we've been making three assumptions uh, throughout this exercise. So the first one is that people are utility maximizing. not income maximizing. Right? So we've been assuming that people maximize their utility or their happiness and not their income. Okay? If this were not true, okay, if compensating wage differentials only exist, right, they'll only exist if this is true. Otherwise, uh, all workers would seek to work the dirty, unsafe, and unpleasant jobs because they would pay more, right? Or uh, if there were no such thing, technically, if there were no such thing as compensating wage differentials, then no one would do the dirty, 
unsafe or unpleasant jobs uh, because they wouldn't pay any more than the other jobs, right? And so that some workers uh, do choose uh, the the um, the the dirty, unsafe, and unpleasant jobs is evidence that they are actually utility maximizing, right? So think of it think of it like this: suppose uh, that you had you know one place where you could work, you made twelve dollars per hour, but it's safe, and another place where you made you know thirteen dollars per hour. Uh, but it's uh, unsafe, right? If if people were not utility maximizing, but instead were income maximizing, no one would ever work here, right? No one would ever work at this company uh, because 12 is less than 13, okay? Uh, but because we know that workers value more than just money because they're maximizing their utility and not their income, we will see some workers pick to work here and other workers pick to work here, okay? And so a what this means uh, is that, again, you know, we're maximizing utility, not income. Now, a corollary of this is that while wages, the dollar wages, might not equilibrate across d these different work environments, right, the overall utility from the pay and working environment combined will tend to equilibrate for the marginal employee, uh, which is a crazy fun assumption, or fun uh, corollary, I should say. Okay? Uh, the second one is that uh, workers have information. Okay? So we assume uh, that workers are aware of the trade-offs uh, that they're making, right? We assume that workers know exactly what it is uh, that they're getting into, right? Okay. So uh, they're aware of the fact that the job they're choosing uh, might entail working in an unclean environment an unsafe environment, an unpleasant environment, or some combination thereof, right? If they do not know this, then the model breaks down a little bit. However, we should also point out that it's very likely uh, that workers will quickly recognize the quality of the environment that they're in and will leave if it's worse than they were led to believe, okay? Now, sometimes this uh, the ability of workers to see where they're working is enough to solve the problem of a potential lack of information, right? So workers will quickly recognize and leave the bad working environments for better ones if the compensating wage differential is not high enough. But other times, this isn't the case. So consider the fact uh, that asbestos was used for years as insulation and that the risks associated with this were largely unknown until 50 years later when we were able to link the exposure to asbestos uh, and medical problems, right? So here the process of learning was far too slow uh, to work for these individual workers who all uh, had essentially retired by the time their health problems actually uh, manifested. And so as a result of the time delay between the working conditions and the effect of those working conditions on workers, cause and effect were largely obscured, preventing the labor market from adjusting so that these people were either paid even higher wages or were given proper safety equipment. Okay, so sometimes uh, the, the information that these workers have is only revealed after a long, or the information that, that workers would want to know, I should say, right? The information that about the working environment that the workers would want to know. Sometimes it's not revealed for a very long time. But the point is that someday, or eventually, it will be, right? Other times it's very quick. So, you know, if I, let's say, uh, when I took the job at Ferris, let's say they gave me an office and, you know, in the corner of the office was a bunch of rotting banana peels or something, right? 
uh, I would very quickly recognize that and say, hey, you know what? Uh, this place, not for me, right? And if, especially if they refused uh, to come over and clean it, right? Then I would very quickly say, you know what? I'm out. I'm done. Okay. Uh, and the third, the third assumption has to do uh, with worker mobility, right? So we assume that workers have a range of jobs from which to choose from. And so, in other words, they have other options uh, should they not like uh, their current combination of wages and work environment, right? And so for most people, this assumption holds true. But there are millions of people in rural areas where this simply isn't the case. And so compensating wage differentials will only arise when workers have a choice between working in a, working in a safe job and working at a risky job. Uh, if all the jobs they can realistically get are risky, then no compensating wage differential will actually arise. Now there are two ways uh, to increase the number of job offers that you have. So one is to get a bunch of job offers at the same time and choose from among them. So you choose, you know, you get six job offers and you pick the one uh, that's best. Another is to take a job and continue looking for a different or better job. Right? So thus, uh, even if someone doesn't have a whole lot of choices for employment today, right, they're likely to have more options over the course of their life to exercise this choice. And so we might find someone working a job uh, that, is, uh, that pays too much for too unsafe of a working environment, or rather uh, the compensating wage differential is not high enough to induce them to work there uh, on their own. In other words, they would rather have a safer working environment and less money, uh, but they might not have a job offer that meets that right now today. But over the course of their lifetime, they'll probably come across one, and if it's good enough, they'll take it, okay? Now, just how mobile are workers? Right? So a recent study found that 22% of all American workers over the age of 20 had been with the same company for less than one year. Now additionally, every month roughly 2% of workers voluntarily quit their current job to go out and find a different job, with only 40% of these people taking a lower paying job uh, than they previously had, right? which implies that these people took jobs that paid less but were in a better environment, while the other 60% took jobs that paid higher. Okay, So we make these assumptions. We assume that people are utility maximizing and not income maximizing. We assume that they know about the decisions that they're making, and we assume that they have options. So workers have options, uh, either today or over their lifetime, All right? So we assume workers are utility maximizing, not income maximizing, that they have information, and that they have uh, options, okay? And so if these three assumptions hold, what we should expect to see are workers who value safety highly, working in safe working environments, and workers who value income highly, working in higher income but potentially less safe or dirtier or less pleasant working environments.